Hey guys, it's Adam from Lucipixel and welcome back. Today I'm going to have a very big talk with you. Big in the sense that I'm quite confident that a very large number of you listening today are going to have a bit of an epiphany. And this epiphany might transform your productivity moving forward in a very big way. And a special thanks goes to uh, a TED Talk that I watched very recently, and I'll link it below, where the speaker, um, the person presenting, uh, talks about how we physically, physically, not mentally, not emotionally, but physically perceive obstacles as being bigger or smaller depending on our focus depending on our goal, depending our, on our particular direction. And she uses exercise as her example. Whereas people who have a goal for getting in shape tend to uh, see the act of exercising or the act of performing at a certain level as smaller than those who don't have the ambition to exercise at all or people who don't have any intention on exercising, that you will physically, your physical measurement and visual measurement of space and effort is smaller if your goal is to overcome that obstacle and train. And she talks about how for some people, it's just they have a much easier time motivating themselves and challenging themselves with, with exercise than others. It might tie in directly to how your mental state affects physically. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying emotionally. It physically affects your apparent obstacles ahead of you, making it feel like a larger or a lesser burden. And I couldn't help but tie this into multiple very important facets of artistic production. One of the things I've spoken about in the past uh, on my channel one of the things I've mentioned is the fact that I would say the number one reason why people reach out to me, the number one reason why people reach out to other people, where artists reach out to other artists for help, is because they're struggling with their motivation. They, f they feel like very often, you know, from, you know, students of mine or, uh, or friends or just people reaching out to me saying, you know, I was really doing well. I was really productive when I was taking the course. And then a couple of months passed and I started to slip again. I started to lose my motivation. I started to drift. And they're feeling like they were in a slump. There was a lot of guilt associated with the fact that they weren't being as productive as they felt they could be. And this is a very, I would say this is a bit of an epidemic for artists where we really put a lot of weight on our shoulders to be productive. But that's where this TED Talk comes into the picture. That's where the shift of focus, the shift of mentality comes into play. Because this shift in focus is not only going to have a direct impact on your productivity as a whole, it's not only going to affect how often and how much growth you achieve from painting, from being artistic, but what you paint as well. And I got a very good example of this. It's something I mentioned during this month's uh, um, Brush Sauce Theater Art Contest that I did with Tyler and uh, Tyler Edlin and Jessica Levy. This was I mentioned this as a, as a global general observation and critique of almost everybody who had submitted work that month. Um, if you're curious which one in particular it is, because it might be later on, it's the one that uh, the Giant Slayer theme uh, that's posted. We're currently September of 2019, so you can go and check it out on, on Tyler Edlund's channel. I'll link it below. What do I mean by this? Well, artistically and in general, in life, one of the things we tend to focus on, one of the, one of the things that can make the, the act of being productive feel and seem overwhelming is that we're focused on the end game. We're focused on the des the ultimate destination we want to get to as artists. And by ultimate destination, usually that ultimate destination is best visualized 
and made tangible through the artists that we admire. So for instance, maybe you were, maybe you are a huge Frazetta fan, or maybe you're a huge Michael Kutcher fan, or maybe you're a huge uh, Tyler Edlin fan, or maybe you're a huge John Singer Sargent fan. And you look at their artwork and you, you dote on their artwork. You just love and admire and fan over their artwork. And that's your focus. You want to be that, or you want to be, quote, that good. But what you're actually doing is you're creating an obstacle. You're putting an obstacle in front of you. You're putting a destination, a goal in front of you that's out of your reach, that's unsurmountable, that's overwhelmingly huge. If you don't reach that destination quickly, you quickly become demotivated because you are comparing who you are today to who you'd like to be in maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now, or maybe five years from now, who knows? But it's not a tangible, reachable goal. And as such, you become overwhelmed, you exhaust yourself, and you put your pen down. Because you've put such a heavy burden, you've basically, you're basically trying to do mount, you're trying to clump climb Mount Everest every single time you pick up your pen. But what if you just take smaller, you, you, you reach out towards smaller goals. You're just focusing on one simple facet of art. One little step forward. What you're going to realize is you're going to feel that euphoria, that excitement of growth. And when you feel that excitement of growth, it's the equivalent of putting your inspiration and motivation on autopilot. I use the skateboarding analogy uh, maybe a month ago or so, my, one of my more recent um, art talks. Uh, I, was, I was explaining how just making small achievements, bringing myself back to basics, be, re-becoming a beginner, was a very exciting experience because it allowed me to experience the joy and euphoria of being able to do something with my body, teaching new muscles in my body to do certain tricks, do certain moves that I couldn't do or that I'd forgotten how to do because I used to skateboard a lot. So a lot of the, these tricks were things that I took for granted. I did them all the time, but I relearned them. And I realized it was that act of simple growth, small things. It didn't have to be big for me to feel the motivation and the drive to grab my skateboard the next day and the next day and the next day and keep on going, keep doing it. Because I was al there was always that little carrot at the end of the stick and the stick was always just barely out of my reach. But if I pick up my skateboard and I, and I, I want to go from being a beginner to being Rodney Mullen overnight, I'm not going to last very long because he's so good. He's so skilled. He's so fluid. He's so trained. And he's been doing it for such a long time that that goal is out of my reach. And I become demotivated. Let's take this into the context of your work. You look at the big picture. You look at the big, big canvas this story this illustration you want to create for yourself in order to create that illustration requires an understanding a mastery or at least a very solid confident grasp of many fundamentals perspective value lighting anatomy pose gesture uh, color etc 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 composition, visual storytelling, set design, you name it. All of these different elements are separate elements. And every one of these separate elements require learning. It requires effort. It requires time. It requires you to drop your focus on some things and apply it to other things. You want to do an ollie? You want, you're taking back that skateboarding analogy? You want, to, you want to do an ollie? Well, you have to get your sense of balance. So first, focus on balancing on the board. Just that. Just focus on just skateboarding without falling off. 
how to maintain speed, how to be able to balance yourself on one for foot so you can kick yourself quickly with the other and travel, how to jump off, just how to fall off of a curb without going flying off the skateboard. All of these things might seem very basic, but they're essential to being able to do other things. If you want to do a kickflip, if you want to do an impossible, if you want to do any of these different tricks, you first have to learn how to balance yourself on the skateboard. That might seem like a total nub loser thing, but it's not when you do it. When you realize that, holy shit, yesterday, I, I just standing on the board, I would wobble and fall off of it. Now I can skate down the street and I can travel and I can actually take it on a trip somewhere. It's a very exciting feeling. The same thing applies to your painting. You're looking at the, you're looking at being the master. You're looking at, I want to be John Singer Sargent. But first you have to figure out values and light and form and proportions and color, all of these different facets. So what you do is, instead of going for the big picture, you just pick out one little facet of that, a little easy hors d'oeuvre sized obstacle. And you put all of your energy into focusing on that and that alone. And when you do that, you will inherit a new skill that you will be able to apply to the big picture. Maybe your composition sucks. So spend weeks, months, just focusing and learning composition. And then once you start to be, develop a bit of a fluidity with that and you feel like you're weak in maybe anatomy, then you spend a couple of weeks and months learning anatomy. It is a very tiny drop in the bucket when you look at the big picture. A couple of months is a dandruff on your shoulder. It is not a big deal whatsoever. But when you've applied yourself to this and you've developed a comfort with it, it's that one less obstacle between you and the big goal. But you're never focusing on the big goal. You're just focusing on all the little goals on the way there. And what this does is it gives you a little shot of adrenaline every single day. That feeling, that knowledge, that drive to know that at the end of the day, you're going to be that little bit better than you were the day before. Because you're focusing on all of your growths rather than focusing on the big failure of who you aren't yet. You can spend your entire career reminding yourself on a daily basis, I'm not Michael Kutcher. I'm still not Michael Kutcher 10 years later, and I'm still not going to be Michael Kutcher 20 years later. And as long as you keep focusing on being Michael Kutcher, you will live in the shadow of failure every single day of your life. You try to maintain motivation with that kind of weight sitting on your shoulders. Good luck. I can't. So just rendering a sphere, applying lighting across it, just playing with fabric, learning how to do that, just focusing on doing fabric and being able to look at what you did yesterday and look at what you do today and seeing a physical demonstrable improvement is a very exciting feeling that motivates you to move forward. And you can think in your head, I'm going to apply that new skill to my character design next time. And my character design is going to be that much better. And your growth is going to be huge. Now, how does this apply to what you paint? Well, it's kind of interesting because this is something that I notice is a very big determining factor between somebody who's more masterful and somebody who's more beginner. And this is something I saw in abundance today recording with Jessica and Tyler, the Brush Sauce Theater Art Contest. I was, I saw a large number of artists that were a, a little bit more novice, not all of them, but they were a little bit more, they were learning artists, they're joining art competitions, they're pushing their skills, hugely motivated artists. But what I noticed they were doing, a lot of these artists were doing, is they were taking on huge overwhelmingly complex epic scenes. They thought this is an image, we're doing an illustration of a giant, like kind of a David and Goliath type of scenario where there's this huge giant attacking smaller, smaller people, right? 
So they're thinking epic. They're thinking cinematic. And there are some illustrations where it's, you know, a landscape shot of a cityscape with river with, you know, a Godzilla type of character t uh, tearing a... Uh, tearing the Golden Gate Bridge apart with his bare hands and there's helicopters shooting shooting missiles and a and a, a, a helicopter machine gunner up in the foreground who's shooting at him, you know, shooting bullets and there's birds flying around and buildings and all kinds of crap and mountains off in the distance. It was an incredibly, hugely complex image for even the most ambitious team of professionals, let alone a single professional doing that on their own. But the color, the value, the rendering, the edge control, the lighting, the perspective, the overuse and misuse of photo bashing made the image not work. This artist was trying to paint a Rodney Mullen sized painting when he hadn't yet learned those basic fundamentals. He hadn't mastered the fundamentals. He didn't need to paint that crazy, complex cityscape narrative. He could have very easily just gone with a monster and, and that monster's victim or that monster's uh, um, opponent, human opponent, and a simple little indication of, a, of, a, of an environment. And that would have been sufficient. And that would have allowed the artist to just focus on the character, focus on the monster, focus on the anatomy, and make those simple elements work. Or even dummy it down even more. Make it very, very simple. Go with basic, go with a Kirby-type character, just a round, spherical, three-dimensional object fighting a really giant Kirby-sized object, you know, a Meta Knight or something like that. He's fighting this against this, this big but simplified geometric shape of a character, but getting that lighting and getting those values and composition to really sing. You take a really beautifully executed, simple drawing, and you put it next to a very complicated, poorly executed drawing, and the simple drawing is going to win because it was done right. Again, I, I come back to I come back to that I think it was was it the rock I, don't, I can't remember no it's Jeff Cavalier from Athlean X he's talking about training and he says he says it's the difference between lifting using weight lifting as the analogy lifting what you can versus lifting what you should an amateur tries to lift what he can he can do 600 pound bench press he's a beast but he's not getting any gains and he's potentially injuring himself in the process and his form sucks and he's not targeting any muscles and versus lifting a weight that allows him to get impeccable form and really isolate the muscle and really utilize that muscle the way it's supposed to in order to get proper development. Who's going to gain faster? Of course, the person who's got better form, not the idiot who's lifting up 600 pounds and blowing out his muscles. It's the same thing. This mentality, this focus on complexity is what's very possibly burdening you emotionally. And as such, when you're sitting down thinking to yourself, how am I going to do this cityscape with this Godzilla and the bridge and uh, all this crazy shit? Instead, let go of that. And just focus on a simple, single facet of art. And if you find that just doing that basic character, doing a basic shape is challenging, then what I want you to do is I want you to get rid of that entire burden altogether and just focus on basic shapes. Maybe that basic, sh maybe the perspective on that basic cube is bad. It's wrong. It's, it's bad perspective. Well, then get rid of that basic shape and just focus on perspective. And just focus on that. Once you get that perspective, you're going to feel empowered. Then you're going to want to take on more, more complex shapes. So you're going to work on more complex shapes. You're going to be able to tackle them. As you slowly work your way up the ladder, one step at a time, you're going to get better and better at it until eventually you can handle more complex shapes. Your transition into doing more human-based shapes that are more complex will start to become less and less of a burden, less and less of an obstacle, and you will feel more and more empowered to move forward. 
you will feel inspired to draw because you know that overcoming that next obstacle is the logical next step and you know you're going to be able to execute it well. And that's a really exciting feeling. That's where that feeling of inspiration comes in is where you can do something you couldn't do before. My son is a very good example. Last year, he would look at my drawings or he'd look at my daughter's drawings, Emily, my 18-year-old, who's studying illustration professionally herself. And she'd look at our very, you know, professional drawings and he would try to imitate them. And he would get very frustrated and he would take his pen or his marker or his pencil, whatever he's drawing with, and he would throw it on the ground and he'd get all frustrated because, he'd see, because he would complain that they didn't look good and he'd start to cry. So recognizing this, knowing that I'm talking to a six-year-old, it was logical for me to say, don't worry about drawing all of these. What he was focusing was on the details and the fabric and the long hair and the expressions. And I said, let go of all of that. Just look for a basic shape. And I, what I did is instead of focusing on, instead of teaching him on a human form, we started drawing Kirby's together. Kirby smiling, Kirby sad, Kirby jumping, Kirby flying, whatever. And he became this master at drawing Kirby's. And then I, we would look, compare Kir his Kirby to the original and say, ah, it looks like the eyes are too big. You got to make them a little smaller. Oh, they're too close together. Got to make them wider apart. Okay, those circles on Kirby's cheeks, they're too, they're too wide apart. You need to put them right under the eyes so they look like cheeks. And he was slowly starting to figure out how to construct a face properly. Fast forward six months later. And he's drawing complex stuff. But it's not complex to him because every single step was a little baby step forward. And we're talking about a six-year-old here. What he can draw now at six years old completely blows my mind. But last year, he could barely draw a circle because what he was trying to do was jump straight into the complexity without mastering the fundamentals. And what we did is we brought him back to the fundamentals. And every single time he sits down to draw, he's proud of himself because he's always accomplishing something he couldn't do before. And now he's not just impressing himself, he's impressing everybody. Well, just because he's six and you're 56 or 16 or 26 or 36 or whatever age you are, does not mean that you learning how to draw circles like a six-year-old makes you as dumb as a six-year-old. It's going to make you as smart as a six-year-old <laughs> because I know a lot of 56-year-olds that can't draw circles properly. They don't understand stand basic shapes. So they spend their entire life hiding behind their fear of learning that basic shape because they're thinking to themselves, shit, I'm already in my 50s or 60s and I still struggle with my fundamentals. And that's embarrassing because somebody who's chosen a career in art should be able to do that at this point in your life. So that guilt keeps you pushing yourself into the wrong domain. No, I don't care if you're my age, if you're 43, or if you're 83, or if you're 13, you have to learn it. It's a stepping stone that you have to learn. And once you do, that knowledge is relative to your age, and you will feel incredibly empowered. Here's a really good example of just this very thing. I spent way too long in my career afraid of anatomy. I must have wasted 15 years of my career shying away from it because I thought it was a subject that was just too complex. And it was constantly an Achilles heel in my artwork. I remember, for instance, really being confused with the neck, really being confused with forearms, which is a very common thing. These are, I, I always struggled to draw a neck properly. So I would wing it. I would try to... I would try to use these kind of like, you know, easy way to draw neck tricks. Don't, no, don't do that. Don't, don't burden yourself with shortcuts. It's only going to make your life harder. Instead, sit down and learn anatomy. Go check out Proko's channel. I know a lot of different artists that I teach anatomy in my mentorship or Anthony Jones. Anybody, just learn it one muscle at a time. Start with the sternum. Then it connect the ribcage to the sternum. Then connect the scapula and the and the scapula to it. And then hook a humerus up to that. Then hook the radius and the ulna up to that. And your carpals and your metacarpals and your phalanges and your spinal cord 
and your pelvis and your and your femur and your tibia and your fibula down to your feet until eventually you've got the whole skeletal structure in there. Learn them all individually. Understand their functionality. Then slowly slap one muscle on top of another until eventually the entire you've, you've tackled the entire superficial human form. You will benefit from that for the rest of your artistic life. But for me, I struggled for so many years avoiding that fear, thinking, crap, I've been in this industry for, for over 15 years professionally. I should know better by now. And I avoided it. And every single time I went to draw a head and a neck and a chest or whatever, whatever part of the body I wasn't entirely familiar with anatomically, I would wing it to the best of my ability and struggled with it greatly. So it was a hit or miss. Sometimes I, it looked okay. Sometimes it looked like crap. And I wasn't ever entirely sure why it worked or why it didn't. It was just kind of a shot in the dark. And then one day, I learned the muscles and the bones of the skull, the neck, the spine, the collarbone, the chest, etc. I learned them. And I look back at my older, and it took me about a, it took me a week to really get a solid understanding of that little area of the body. And I looked back at drawings I'd done for the last 10, 15 years and laughed and went, I can't believe I, I wasted so many years worrying about this when I could have solved it in a week. One week and all of these worries would have been washed away. I, look at, I was looking at a lot of these a lot of these submissions again for the brush sauce theater for the art contest. And again, five sixths of the artists who submitted these pieces have all these characters. They're all humanoids. They're giants. They're humans. They're humanoid like creatures. They're alien like giants and all this, all with anatomy. And the majority of them didn't know anatomy. Not because they're incompetent or amateur, because they're afraid of it. One week, it would be solved. It wouldn't only be solved for that drawing, it would be solved for the rest of their life moving forward. So learn it. Learn it well. Learn it properly. And you don't have to learn the entire body in one shot. Just focus on the upper arm. Focus on the bicep. That's it. One muscle a day. Before you know it, you'll solve the entire human form. One bone a day, one muscle a day. That's all you need. Of course, that's a very simple task. You might want to, it might not be, it might not drive you enough to learn three or four bones a day. Who cares? By the end of that week, you will have knowledge you will be able to carry with you for the rest of your life. And it's doing something else at the same time. All of this untapped knowledge, all of this, all of these untapped small fundamental lessons that you're skipping is also doing something else that's adding to the weight of your motivation, adding to the weight of picking up that pencil every day. Your lack of knowledge causes stress. Your lack of confidence causes stress. Every single time you pick up that pen to draw something and you know you're not entirely versed on what it is that you're trying to do, your lack of confidence is a weight on your shoulders isn't it? I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. We're all artists here, right? I, I can say this because I'm there with you. I've been through this and I continue to be. I continue to experience this every single day with facets of art that I still haven't yet completely tackled. I don't, I don't have complete confidence with them. Every single step in your life is always going to be faced with this, but every single thing that I'm not completely confident with, the professional in me has learned to use these as clues on what I need to learn next. And guaranteed, you will never run out of things to learn next. There isn't a single day that passes. I've taught anatomy for years, and there isn't a single day that has ever passed where I don't have a student or a friend or a fellow artist teach me something about human anatomy or animal anatomy that I didn't know. And they'll go, you know that this goes there and that's for this. And I'm like, holy shit, I didn't know that. Thank you. Or I'll have a student ask me a question because I'm 
answering all of these questions based on my already pre-existing knowledge. And they'll say, but what about that? And I'll go, I'm not sure. Let's go look it up. And I'll go and I'll look it up and I'll go, oh, okay, I get it. That makes sense. And okay, and that connect. Okay, cool. I get it. I didn't know that that's why that little bump was there. Okay, I get it. Cool. Thanks. Great question. And I walk away a smarter artist. I walk away with new knowledge. And that new knowledge is something I'm excited to teach my next student. And then that next student asks the next question that I can't answer. I look it up and I grow. Every single student I have teaches me and gives me growth, adds to my pre-existing knowledge, and that passes on to the next artist. I'm going to say this last thing, and this is a bit of boasting. It's def No, it's not a bit of it's It's a huge boast. <laughs> I posted a video last year about World of Warcraft. You can go and check it out. I'll link it in the description below. It's a video about World of Warcraft where I spoke about what it was that I believed was the reason why World of Warcraft was failing, why it was dying, why they stopped posting this, their subscribers when they went from having a millions and millions of subs, being the top of the top, having a player base that stuck around endlessly, loyally, myself included, to just being too bored to play the game. Was it because of the graphics? No. Was it because of, you know, the, the gameplay mechanics? Yes, but not the way they thought. Was it because there weren't enough things to do? Absolutely not. <laughs> Endless, a plethora of things to do. It's because what they took away from the game were the small things. They tried to solve the small things by making the game more convenient. They had people who would whine and complain that dungeons were too difficult, that mobs took too long to kill, that it took too long to walk from point A to point B, that everything was a grind, that there were too many, you know, too many, uh, too much preparation and grinding and mat collecting and crafting that you'd have to do in order to get ready to do a raid. And the raids were too big and too complex and it took too long to put these things together, that it was cumbersome and people were complaining about it. And Blizzard thought the way to solve this problem would, would be to make the game more convenient. Instead of going and spending hours in, you know, in trade chat, trying to look for a group and trying to put together a 40-man a raid for Molten Core, instead, they created looking for group. They made it cross realm so you wouldn't have to depend on the people on your own realm. And you could just click a button and you could cross realm and you could be in a queue and up and running and running a dungeon in a matter of minutes versus hours. They made the game suburban. They made it nerfed. They made it easy, accessible. Money was easy to come by. Experience was super fast. You don't, you're not gearing fast enough? Buy some heirlooms. You can boost. You can boost the percentage of, of experience you gain per mob, and you can make it from zero to zero to zero to max level in a week. And the more people complained, the more convenient they made that game. Until eventually, there was nothing left to play. The game was literally autopilot. And you could literally sit in the middle of a field with a bunch of monsters and go AFK away from keyboard. You could just walk, you could just leave your you could just leave the desk and go and make yourself some lunch, watch a couple of YouTube videos and come back twenty minutes later and the mobs were still smacking at you and your health was about halfway down. And then you could cast one spell and nuke them all and walk away. Where's the challenge in that? There is no challenge. There's no threat. Blizzard thought that what people truly wanted was a way to burn their, their, their way up to the end game. And in the process of burning their way all the way to the end game, they lost the joy of the, what really made the game fun in the first place. The grind. The slow, methodical, frustrating, time-consuming grind that it took to get from zero to level 60. They thought the grind was what people didn't want, when in fact it's exactly what people wanted. People wanted to struggle. People wanted to complain. People wanted to grit their teeth and get frustrated because they had to walk back from the goddamn wherever they died all the way back to their corpse because there weren't enough things and there weren't enough bat handlers and you know, getting a mount was so goddamn expensive, etc., etc., etc. 
And people complained about it on the forums. And what Blizzard did was they, they reacted too fast to their spoilt kids. And said, fine, 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 here you'll have, we'll, we'll, we'll put, we'll put, uh, we'll make everything cheap and put, put bats and, and mailboxes all over the map so you'll never have to run again. And what happened? They got bored of the game and they left. And then just a couple of weeks ago, just last week, we finally, after enough bitching and complaining from players, myself included, they decided to reopen the classic server. They took away all of those conveniences. They took away all of those, all of those, you know, quality of life perks that came with the new version of the game. And they went right down to the core game. Crappy old graphics, old music, old graphics, old maps, old effects, old mobs. But if you stood out in the field, if you tried to pull more than one mob at a time, you're dead. You'll run out of mana. You'll just get ganked and you won't be able to survive the shot. An elite walks out, of, walks through the, through the forest, get the hell out of the way. Because if you want, he'll one-shot you if you go anywhere near it, and then you're going to have to walk back to your corpse. But what it did is it made every single small facet of that game relevant. Crafting, getting a new piece of armor, a new weapon, a new potion, everything has this feeling of accomplishment. Making it from level 10 to level 11 is a big accomplishment. You get an extra point to put in your, oh, talent tree. I missed talent trees because <laughs> they got rid of them. They tried to nerf everything and simplify it. No, the talent trees are back. And now every single time you make it to a level, making it to that next level, upgrading a piece of gear, adding that one little point to your talent tree gives you a sense of growth. Little, small, insignificant, but very meaningful and very enjoyable growth. And as such, may, may, the, may the statistics speak for me that they have experienced more growth and more engagement in their game in the last week than any game in the history of games. That World of Warcraft Classic has streamed more views and more attention online than any game in the history of games, including Fortnite, including Minecraft, including all of that. It's beat all the competition because the gamers were starving for challenge. They were starving for things to feel relevant. And by taking away all of those conveniences, by forgetting about that end goal and just focusing on the joy of getting one little accomplishment at a time and slowly working your way up the ladder as long as it takes was where engagement and growth and inspiration and progression truly mattered. And that's, that's an analogy for your life. That's an analogy for your day-to-day -day growth. Stop trying to, don't chase after the end game. Just focus on those little day-to-day -day bits of growth, those little fundamentals, those little accomplishments. That's what's going to keep you going every day. And that, it's that little day-to-day -day struggle that you go through, those little pushes that you give yourself every day that won't only fuel your own soul, but will bind you and bond you to the rest of the industry for everybody else who's been on that journey with you. So you can, when you see a fellow artist walking down the street with their stylus pen or with their sketchbook, you look at each other and you smile. Just as if somebody was wearing a World of Warcraft classic t-shirt on, you look at them and you smile going, yeah, you're my brothers and sisters. You know, I feel you. We've, we've done the grind together. And they smile back. And you can share that commonality with them because that is essentially what makes us a community. And that's essentially what makes us, what, what forges us into the people that we are. Okay? So hopefully this will help you get out of your slump. Focus on just tomorrow. Focus on the little goal for tomorrow. And that growth will fuel your motivation moving forward. All right? So with that said, I love you all with all my heart. Happy painting. And I'll see you next time. Take care.